The Great Dyke of Zimbabwe is one of the largest mafic and ultramafic igneous intrusions on Earth that is visible from the surface, and its formation has been dated near the end of the Archean at about 2.6 billion years ago. This formation involved magma emplacement into faults, which underwent fractional crystallization, and this was fed by a series of magma chambers below, which became progressively linked. The purpose of this lecture is to discuss the physical and geological model, as well as petrogenesis, with a focus on tectonic setting, initial melt, and fractional crystallization. There will also be some discussion about the economic importance and economic potential of platinum group elements, as well as nickel and copper in the Great Dyke. I first wanted to provide a quick overview of the exploration history of the Great Dyke. The first reports of the Great Dyke itself date back to around 1865, and this was primarily by explorer Carl Mosch. More analysis and exploration led to the first report of platinum in 1918, which was found in a body of dunite with serpentine alteration. And as you can see in the following decades, there were more magnetic, gravity, and mineral composition studies. And this eventually led to exploration, drilling, and mining in 1993. And this is because it was found to be rich in minerals, including chromite, platinum group element sulfides, and nickel. So we're going to talk about the physical model, and I just wanted to start on Google Earth to give you a sense of scale as well as where we are. So we're in Zimbabwe, which is this country down here on the continent of Africa. And if we start zooming in, you can already see uh, the Great Dyke right along here. And just to give you a sense of scale, from the bottom here to the top here is about 550 kilometers. And I'll zoom in a little bit more, but another term that you'll hear is the Zimbabwe Craton, and that's basically referring to the older country rock surrounding this intrusion. So now we have a couple zoomed in satellite images. And again, for scale, this th width is about 11 kilometers wide. Same here, here, it's all about 11 kilometers wide. And then in the south end, right here, and right here, it narrows down to about four kilometers wide. Um, again, this is a mafic and ultramafic composition igneous intrusion that intruded in Archean granitoids and greenstone belts in the Zimbabwe craton. And one final thing to notice just here is that you can see fault here and a large scale fault here that is through both the dike and the craton and therefore since crystallization. So now we have a plan view map of the Great Dyke. So the first thing to notice is that there's a north chamber and a south chamber. And so the first reason for this distinction is that ground penetrating radar has revealed a deep structure underneath the intrusion. And that has been interpreted as a feeder dike. Um, and it's continuous throughout the length of the dike, except there's a big discontinuity at the north and south chamber. A couple other reasons, the south chamber, the rock units are generally thinner and more cyclic than in the north chamber. And another thing is the north chamber has a much greater volume with a maximum stratigraphic thickness of about three and a half kilometers. And then we can further divide it into five subchambers on the right here and their associated complexes. The subchambers are based off similar style, structure, and layers. And the complexes, you'll notice, all have this mafic sequence at the center. Here I've included a cross section for reference, and you can see the subchamber is labeled across the top and connected by interpretation. Now let's look at this cross section from ground penetrating radar. So you notice how it has this trumpet or boat like shape, right? And also this deep heel. And it's been interpreted from geologists that this deep heel indicates that magma rose up from deep faults connecting to the continuous feeder dike below that we just talked about. Also, a physical reason for this shape is that it was this contact here was likely part of a grob and being faulted, faulted downwards at some point in time. And, and then if we look at these rock layers, you'll notice that they get thin as, thinner as you move out from the central axis. And it turns out they also get more fine grained and more petrologically evolved. And this can be explained by the effects of differential magma cooling from the shape of this intrusion. And then finally, one thing to note is that although it has the name the Great Dyke, many would actually argue that it should be considered a lopolith due to the consistent inward dipping to the central axis as well as the sheer size and orientation. Now we're gonna look at the rock units. So on the right of this slide, there's a stratigraphic section from the Darwindale subchamber. And although there's some variation between the different subchambers that we previously mentioned, they all follow the same general mineralization and they all show a top mafic sequence with an underlying ultramafic sequence. And if we start down here at the ultramafic sequence, uh, the rock types are olivine bronstatite, harzbergite, peroxenite, 
And then you can see these thin black layers here are thin chromate seams. A couple things to point out that we're going to talk about later in the lecture are these cyclic units here where you're rotating in cycles through different rock types. And then another thing to point out is this P1 layer here and MSZ, the main sulfide zone. And those are going to be important near the end of the lecture when we talk about economic geology and the platinum group elements in this intrusion. And if we move up to the mafic sequence, the rock types are olivine gabbro, gabbro-norite, and norite. And just to give you a sense of scale, this lower mafic section here is about medium to coarse grain, 700 meters thick. This middle mafic section is about 100 meters thick and is fine to medium grained. And the upper mafic section is about 300 meters thick. And of course, this change in grade and size as you move up makes sense with what we know about differential cooling in large igneous intrusions. So on the next slide, we're going to show a modal distribution of this lower mafic section and this websterite layer here. And the modal distribution is going to be of a different subchamber. So just take note of the proportions here. So here we're looking at the modal distribution in the lower mafic sequence and websterite layer of the Sabakwe subchamber. Um, this is mostly just for reference and to give you a sense of the variation between the subchambers, but you can see it's primarily clinoperoxene gabbro-norite, a little bit of OPX gabbro-norite, a tiny bit of norite and gabbro, and then the websterite down here. And here are some photos of drill core from the Great Dyke. If you want to look more closely at these rock types, you can see websterite here, gabbro-norite here, some olivine oikocris here, here, and then some bronze to type here. So now we're going to look at petrogenesis, and we're going to start specifically with tectonic setting. So the proposed tectonic setting that seems to have taken hold is from Wilson in 1987. And this has been basically involves four steps, and there's an illustration of these four steps on the right. And just to start, we have the Zimbabwe craton here and the Limpopo province here, right? So in the first step, there's an overthrusting of the Limpopo province onto the Zimbabwe craton. And this creates a north-northwest oriented compressive stress. And then this stress is sustained. So then in two, we see eventually resulting from that compression, we have uh, the Popotique fault set forming, uh, sinistral strikes out faults. And then down in three, eventually as the tectonic forces change through time, this stress rotates to the north-northeast orientation. And then this causes extension in certain locations of the previously formed faults. And this is likely why the magma started to creep up from the linked magma chambers below into this fractured and faulted craton. And then eventually in four, we have in step four, the stress rotates back to north northwest, causing dextral movement, and this allows more magma emplacement. So just to give a larger scale sense of this tectonic process, we have a map here. And you can see outlined in yellow is the Limpopo province down here at the bottom. And then this is the Great Dyke today uh, along here. So you can now you can visualize the north-northwest oriented and north-northeast oriented compressive stresses causing faults of and then eventually magma emplacement. One thing I wanted to focus on in terms of petrogenesis are the ultramafic cyclic units. And you can see on the right, uh, that previous stratigraphic section zoomed in on the ultramafic sequence. So when we're thinking of the formation of these cyclic units, uh, it can be boiled down to this general process. So you have initial magma injection followed by fractional crystallization. And it turns out that the chamber was, pr was pretty sealed. So it was a good environment for fractional crystallization. And then at some point, there would be a fresh injection of magma. So as those elements are being used up in fractional crystallization, when you get the fresh injection of magma, they're replenished. So you can go back to those previous minerals that were being formed. So it's basically just a cycle of magma injection followed by fractional crystallization, followed by more magma injection. And uh, some of the evidence for this came from Hughes in 1979, looking at mineralogy, as well as proportion analysis of the ultramafic units and the chromium content. A couple other things this research revealed is that it was a parental magma rich in magnesium, also, that the magma composition showed the general trend of becoming more evolved or modified in each injection. And we're going to look more at the initial magma composition in the next slide.
The most accurate geochron study has dated the Great Dyke at 2,575 million years ago formation. And this particular study also found that it experienced rapid cooling relative to its size and geological time. So when we look at the initial magma composition, uh, there's several studies that have been done, but they've all showed a high concentration of magnesium and silica, resulting in an ultramafic magma. Now those high concentrations don't necessarily prove an ultramafic magma on their own, so we want some additional evidence. So one piece of evidence is that the early crystallization formed high magnesium orthoperoxine followed by olivine. Another thing is we can compare this to the Bushveld complex, which is a well-studied igneous intrusion in Africa. And we see that the Great Dyke has high CR2O3 values. Another thing is that in contrast with the Bushveld complex, the Great Dyke has constant strontium values in rocks and mineral samples. And what this tells us is that although there's some felsic crustal contamination, nothing significant. So we're dealing with a primitive magma sourced from lithospheric mantle under the continent that is enriched in silica. For reference, I've just included four initial composition estimates for the magma, which have come from normative calculations. And although there's some variation between each estimate, you can see the same general trend, right? High silica along here and high magnesium down here. I'm not going to spend much time on this, but I wanted to highlight the Xenolith, the country rock intrusions. And just for a sense of scale, these can range in size from meters to hundreds of meters in diameter. So not surprisingly, there's some Xenoliths that come from the Zimbabwe Craton greenstone belt. And these have recrystallized into coarse green pigmatic quartz gabbros. Uh, there's also some Xenoliths that are made up of quartzite, uh, which have actually resisted recrystallization. I also wanted to highlight some satellite intrusions, and these can be grouped into two groups. So first, the southern satellite dikes of mafic composition. You can see the rock types on the screen are similar to the Great Dike itself. And then for scale, about 150 to 600 kilometers width. Uh, we also have some sa outer satellite dikes, and there's two main ones, which have been highlighted in yellow on the map to the right. Um, they're both similar in terms of mineralogy and composition, consisting of quartz gabbros, gabbronorites with subophytic textures. Uh, one interesting thing about the east dike here is that it's actually continuous for most of the length of the Great Dike. I wanted to talk just a bit about mining to show why we care and why so much research has been dedicated to the Great Dike of Zimbabwe. And the reason for this is the platinum group elements, which are found in this P1 layer, but more specifically the sulfide zone here. And the reason that they are located right here is because the primary magmatic processes resulted in separation of sulfide from the magma. So this map on the right shows some mines that have been established along the Great Dike. One problem they have encountered is not high enough grade of these platinum group elements. So in order to economically and efficiently process the ore. The problem, however, isn't about a lack of minerals and elements there to extract. And I just included this quote from 2019 to show that. It says, the deposit is estimated to contain 243 tons of platinum group elements in proven and probable reserves. If we think back to the original purpose, it was to discuss the physical and geological model as well as the petrogenesis and mining of the Great Dyke of Zimbabwe. To summarize some of these key points, we concluded that it was a mafic and ultramafic composition intrusion with cyclic units, and these cyclic units were because of a cycle of magma injection followed by crystallization followed by more magma injection. We also said that it was a good system for fractional crystallization because the system was relatively sealed other than those magma injections. We also looked at the physical model, the intrusion shape. We saw that trumpet intrusion shape and the outward thinning rock layers from the central axis. And so we saw how the shape itself had a great effect on cooling. Finally, we looked at initial composition estimates of the magma, and we concluded that the magma would have likely have been high in magnesium and silica and been andesitic or tholeitic magma. If you're interested in further, further investigation, I would recommend reading about the mining history and some of the problems that have been encountered, such as low recovery rates. And if you do this, you'll recognize how there's been a great need for innovative metallurgical processing techniques. Thanks for watching.